We're going to go ahead and jump in and get started here. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining. I'm going to hop on in. OK, so just a little bit about me. My name is Jocelyn Reed. I'm the founder and CEO of Revolve Learning. And I've been in education about 15 years now, exclusively in urban communities as an educator, instructional coach, leadership development coach, partnership director. Um, but most importantly, I consider myself to be a lifelong learner and an advocate for underserved communities. I am also the super proud mother of a 10 year old fifth grade Greater this year, and um, his name is Zaire, light of my life. Um, but just to scratch the surface a little bit about what brought me to this work, I founded Revolve Learning for several reasons, but one reason that is um, the fact that I know that the children that I've dedicated my life to just simply don't have access to the same opportunities as my own child. It's what keeps me up at night. And um, when I entered this field of education, even going to school specifically for teaching, I never was truly prepared to best serve in the communities um, that have historically experienced an unthinkable amount of adversity. And it was not my background growing up either. Um, if I fast forward and sort of reflect on my teaching and coaching career, I kind of just got lucky. I wanted to quit teaching after my first year, after my first few years, actually actually. And uh, this was actually the gift my parents got me at, for my first apartment after that first year of teaching. They thought I would really um, love it. They are very literal, literal parents. They are. Um, but when I say I got lucky, I just kind of happened to find a method of teaching that worked for me on YouTube. Um, and I just honed in on that as my style. And on top of that, I happen to be teaching next door to some really amazing educators that I just got close with that helped me see even more possibilities in joyful teaching. So I won the awards, I came out the classroom with what I thought I had to do to continue moving forward in my career, which is totally not true. We'll save that story for another day. Um, I stumbled upon the science of learning and development when I went to work for a nonprofit. Um, I've been teaching that science ever since because my mind has been blown every time I share this content that I ever stepped in front of kids, just really ignorant to their basic needs and the reality of their lives. So even at the time that I won this award, I was still getting a lot wrong in just understanding everything going on with my kids and the impact that it was having on their development. But there was one thing as I was preparing for this session that I believe I got right and I stumbled upon that. I'll share that with you now because I spoke briefly about it that night. <laughs> um. The reason why I'm a teacher is because I believe teaching saves lives. I believe teaching saves lives. And when I allow my students to express themselves and celebrate themselves as individuals and share their thoughts and opinions and do it in a respectful and responsible way, I am preparing them for when they will ultimately face those challenges. And you know, that's the only thing that they are guaranteed. All my students know the only thing they're guaranteed is a challenge when they leave my doors. So I just want to prepare them. And when I have my son, I just want him to be prepared for whatever he faces and the challenges will be great, but he will be prepared to face those obstacles no matter what. Um, this is an amazing, amazing honor. And um, I just thank you. So that was my mindset. My mindset is what I feel like I got right. What I believed about the ability and the potential of my students, the reason why I did it, why I continued to show up, I was really clear about that in preparing my students for the inevitable challenge in the best way that I knew how. So I get really extra, extra amped for opportunities like this because this is genuinely just what I wish I knew before my first year of teaching. So here we are through Revolve Learning, I am committed to shedding some light on this side of the education ecosystem, really fighting for this type of equity work to be core knowledge alongside all of the wonderful mainstream pedagogy and theory that we all know and love. I do things a little bit differently by leading with context. So I'm not just here to give you a bunch of science and just kind of hope it lands somewhere in your mental shelf among all things sort of teaching and learning. 
this is what I believe has to be foundational common knowledge if you commit to working with students, parents, communities that are largely underrepresented or misrepresented in all of the textbooks and the courses and what we'll learn about surprisingly today, even the studies that have been done about trauma and adversity. So we want you to kind of understand the context in which you're teaching first and then give you the science, the research, all the strategies to support you while you're there. For this session, we have three objectives. We have understanding how biology and context work together to, to drive individual development and learning. We're gonna analyze how aspects of a student's context can support or hinder their development and learning. And then we're gonna start building our toolkits for strategies to think about student de-escalation and remaining emotionally constant. The session today will follow a launch, learn, land, lead format, okay? You will notice that there are participant materials. It's in the Whova chat. I posted a link if you want to sort of walk through. It's an editable PDF if you want to kind of take notes and type them as we go along. You can also respond freely as you uh, see fit to the content that I'm teaching today in the Whova app. Um, and then we'll take some questions and answers. We'll do a Q&A at the end of this session as well. So you can type in the Q&A questions there. All right, so let's get into it. So as I mentioned before at Revolve Learning, doing things differently, leading with context, we believe that all learning revolves around relationships. So every session we make it a point to mention our social responsibility connections. Who am I, how are you, and where are we going? So while we might ask different questions sort of within those different thought buckets, we wanna make sure that it grounds us as individuals, it encourages us to collaborate, and then propels us forward as a learning community. People don't care what you know until they know that you care. So for this session, we're thinking about who am I? Students don't learn from who they don't trust. With everything going on, they will be wondering who you are, and it's best to know that answer. We're thinking about students wondering if you care enough to take the next step and asking how they are, if you're listening, what is it? Um, that is what you use as the foundation to your academic content, starting with your students as the content. And then after that, you can go somewhere, go somewhere that finally brings their culture and lived context alongside of the learning, okay? So to start out, over the course of this session, we're going to like be circling back and checking back in on our social responsibility. But I just want to take 30 seconds to just stop, reflect. Why are you here? What do you hope to learn? Who do you aspire to be? Just a quick 30 seconds to set that intention. Okay, so we're gonna enter in our learn phase here. All right, I get really excited about this stuff. The science of learning and development. It is a very long and no offense to the writers, but a very dense read of science. So I've taken that and pulled out just one sentence for each of the components that is just a must know. So I'm gonna briefly go over what each of the four components consist of because that is the base that we're gonna apply the lens of context of our communities on top of. So we understand just what is universally true about the brain and the body as it relates to learning and development, okay? So first we have context. Context is simply the understanding that everyone is influenced by their environments, relationships, and experiences. Malleability is that understanding that our brain grows based on that context and that the neural tissue is the most susceptible to change. Then continuum is just that it starts prenatally and it continues throughout adolescence, which is a surprisingly uh, and relatively new concept. They used to think that our development, our brain development stopped in our early childhood years. More on that in a second. And then we have integration. This is that evidence that we have of that growth over time where our brain is growing more complex, more cross-wired, again, because of everything that we have going on in our lives, okay? So let me prove it to you. Our brain is built in response to experience, 
okay, at the cellular level that is called neuroplasticity, neuromalleability, and over time, okay, that connection process looks like our neurons creating, strengthening, pruning, and reorganizing. And all of that is happening in a functionally integrated way in the brain. So you're like, yes, okay, what does that look like? So at birth, the neurons of our brain will look something like this. Like they're there, they're hanging out, they're just getting started. Fast forward to six years, the neurons look something like this. Very different picture. Fast forward again to 14 years and this is what we have. Now, if you think back, when you were around six years old in that, in that childhood time frame, you were trying everything. You wanted to try, do everything and you wanted to do it by yourself. Like that's that age. So you can see you have many pathways that are just building and firing off at that stage. Think about yourself at 14 years old. Now you're like, oh, I like that. I like that. And I don't really like that too much. You stop doing certain things. You stop practicing certain skills, but you really start honing in on your interests at that time. And so we see the brain actually changes to support that, the pruning away of certain connections and the strengthening of others. So this is also scientific evidence of why it's harder to learn new skills as adults as opposed to younger adolescent years when our brains are just building the most. It's not impossible, but just much harder. <laughs> So every child is on their own developmental pathway. All of that is depending on context, my favorite word. So when I say context, what do you mean? Okay, I mean um, context is the most important thing for teachers and leaders to get in the habit of considering first alongside all of the knowledge about the brain and stress that we'll get into later. So it means children, all humans are only the extent of their environments, their experiences, and their relationships, okay? So that means that when students come through the doors of our schools or when they pull up their table uh, to their kitchen table for virtual learning, they also bring along their unique context. In the side door of buildings and at your kitchen tables or on your couches, as adults, we're also bringing along our bags of context as well, okay? I have one fact that I always love to nerd out on. It's one of my favorite facts. There are over 20,000 genes in the human genome and fewer than 10% ever get expressed in a lifetime. So I like to think of this now as like the supreme brilliance that every person has within them. And we're only blessed to see the tip of the iceberg of each person. So how does the chosen 10% of genes get their golden ticket? That is the context. The genetic expression depends on you doing life with people in relationships, the experiences that you've been through with those people and the environments that you've lived in and through, okay? So I also like to make this connection here because once you start thinking about the science in this way, you just see it everywhere. One of my favorite artists and Pulitzer Prize winner, um, Kendrick Lamar has this lyric in one of his songs, I got loyalty, got royalty inside my DNA. And K Kendrick's lyrics are even supported by what the science tells us. Loyalty, yes, we are social creatures that are built for relationships. But royalty, while it's more figurative, it always makes me pose this question for educators. Do you believe it about your students? Do you believe that your students have the full potential already inside their DNA because you can't teach students that you don't innately believe in. One of the essential understandings at Revolve Learning is that we as educators don't give kids potential. We only unlock it and help kids access what is already there, okay? So we have this, um, based on all that core knowledge in the science of learning and development, now we know we know what we want to see in adults in front of students, whether they're virtual or in person. We need educators that empower opportunities instead of enhancing the vulnerabilities. And I want to be really specific about the vulnerabilities that educators can enhance if they're not mindful of their approach. And then we'll get into some of the awesome opportunities as well. Another essential understanding is that trauma has no zip code. This is a common misconception. Trauma can occur wherever people are. 
and is also not subjected to the east quadrants of cities. We can't say, oh, this is northeast and this is southeast. This is where the trauma happens, something that people innately think because of their bias, their fear, and then limited understanding of trauma. So let's level set on that definition of trauma, okay? Trauma occurs when children or anyone are exposed to events or situations that overwhelm their ability to cope with what they have just experienced. It can be a single event or a series of events, or it could be a chronic condition and it's highly individualized, okay? It can be perceived differently by different people, even if it's the same event that they're witnessing or experiencing or going through. So one example I like to use here is like a, a car bender, a car bender, a fender bender or a car accident. Um, multiple people can be in a car and have a very different experience of how they felt in that moment. For one person, it could have been one of many fender benders and it kind of sucks, but then they just go on about their day. Another one, it could have been their first accident or it could have reminded them of a family member that they lost recently in that way. And then they don't get in a car for weeks. So individualized because we all bring to the table that different context and lived experience to that point. While we're level setting, let's talk about ACEs, okay? So adverse, anything that prevents success or development, harmful or unfavorable, before the age, prior to 18 years of age, and then experiences, events that happen to or around a child that would impact their growth or development. Now, ACEs came on the scene because Kaiser Permanente in California did a study, 1997, around 17,000 people. From that study, they identified 10 types of childhood experiences. I'm gonna give you a couple seconds to look over this list while you're looking over this list, I want you to consider what's missing. Okay. So based on that original ACE study of 17,000, there were some health and wellness outcomes that have been linked. For children who have experienced four or more ACEs from that list, um, and there are ACEs that, have, that go unbuffered by a trusted adult, very important to note that, they could experience 32 times more likely to have learning or behavioral challenges, two to three times greater risk for developing heart disease or cancer, 10 to 12 times greater risk for intravenous drug use and attempted suicide, and eight out of 10 leading causes of death in the US correlate with the exposure of four or more ACEs, unbuffered by a trusted adult. The most humbling statistic from the original ACE study was that children that experience six or more ACEs that are unbuffered by an adult on average have a lifespan shortened by nearly 20 years, and that is heavy. But think, it does not include items that you might have thought about that were missing from that list of original 10. Here are a few more that we have thought of. Now, I wanna share with you a possible reason based on a deeper dive into the stats of the original A study why so many of these experiences that we know impact the communities, um, many of the communities, even in DC, um, why they might have been left off of that original list. As I hinted at towards at the top of the session, communities that we know um, experienced those additional challenges simply weren't the focus of the original A study done in California, represented on the left side of your screen. On the right side of your screen is the most ongoing study, it's the most recent ongoing study uh, regarding ACEs. It's an optional state study offered by the BRFSS. It is a touch phone survey um, that only started including the neglect questions in 2019, and no states participate in that study every year. So we see in the original ACE study on the left, the population that took this survey was 75% white, and that percentage hasn't changed too much in the state study at 68%. Other statistics to mention is that 
75.2% attended some college or were college graduates. 66% were over the age of 50, again, recalling events from before they were 18. And they were also Kaiser members that were already there for their annual physical visits. So what does this mean? It means that the data that we have on ACEs is not only severely out of date, it's also not inclusive of the current climate, it's also not inclusive of the communities that face the most adversity and systemic oppression. So when I showed you those statistics, that is only for the demographic of people that are 75% white educated going to their annual visits at Kaiser in the mid 90s. So we can no longer accept data at face value because it actually paints a picture of a larger issue. So when we think about it, what do we think this statistic looks like in the communities that we service in DC that are heavily impacted by the list of experiences that we added to the list of 10? I think we all would agree that this average lifespan would be shortened significantly more. That is representative of what we are seeing in the news and on our streets today. And this is what I meant by teaching saves lives. I didn't know these statistics or the science behind it when I was a teacher, when I was um, in school to become a teacher. So this work is vital. It is literally life-saving. So let's recap. The science of learning and development it tells us that the context is a person's environments, experiences, and relationships. We add ACEs to the mix, right? So we need to add our, we need to add to our definition of context to also include the societal structures that our students are interacting with both directly and indirectly. We can't ignore the fact that our students are planted in the community and that comes with much more beneath the surface. So these are what I call adverse community experiences. And I encourage you for the rest of your career, if you are aspiring to be a true equitable educator or leader, uh, push any expert that brings up ACEs to explain their experience directly working with communities and, and where they're represented in the data. That is how we push the needle forward to equity right from our schools and classrooms um, and push for our data to actually be updated to represent what we're going through right now, okay? So now that we know a little bit more about the external factors, let's talk about the internal factors of stress. So there are actually three different types of stress. We have positive stress, which always sounds super weird for me to say, <laughs> but this is the stress that generally helps you perform in some way. It's brief and then it's over. You're studying for a big test, you're super stressed out, then you take the test, Woo, that's over. Now we can do some online shopping. Positive stress, you just needed it to get over the hump. Then we have tolerable stress, which is serious, but it's temporary, okay? Think about like the loss of a loved one but the key here is that when you think about those times, you had relationship support that buffered those tough times. They helped you get through. You think about that. You're like, you know what? I don't know what I would have done without you, without you, without you. In those times, you were likely experiencing tolerable stress because of those relationships. Now we have toxic stress. Now toxic stress is strong, frequent, prolonged activation of your stress response system and it's the absence of protective relationships in those moments. So the ACEs we learned about before, all of them, cause toxic level stress. Kids are going through it and not getting a release in their stress response system. I think about this as daily PTSD, but no post because it never lets up, okay? So what we know is that for all children, positive relationships and environments actually is what buffers the effects of stress and that will help catalyze healthy development in our, our students. So I just wanna take 30 seconds, one, so I can drink some water, but two, for you to kind of just think through before we go into this next phase of learning, what makes stress tolerable for you as an adult now? And what relationships stand out that have made a difference or continue to make a difference in how you handle and manage stress today. Just 30 seconds. Okay. 
Okay. All right. So when you're in a stressful moment, we're going to kind of dive in there. So in moments of stress, the brain and the body, they express um, a rush, experience a rush of two hormones. Those hormones are adrenaline and cortisol. They will make you experience symptoms like quicker breathing, sweating, faster heartbeat, stomach constrictions, extra energy to your arms and legs. Now, adrenaline and cortisol can be helpful. If you're biking on the street and a car comes, you need it. If you're camping in the woods, a bear comes, you need it. If our bodies didn't produce them, we will be terrible at survival, okay? You would step off the curb and you would go, wow, that car seems to be going very fast. And you and your shoddy reflexes will not move fast enough to last or exist for another day. So adrenaline and cortisol, we need it. But as a result of toxic stress in the classroom, if teachers aren't mindful of how this impacts learning, it can be a really challenging situation. We'll talk about that in a second. So there's an upside to the hormonal story that I want to mention. We aren't only filled with stress hormones. So if we look at this picture, our eyes can tell us there is power in this moment, but science actually tells us this is more than a hug. We actually have in this moment, moments like this, neurotransmitters, serotonin, dopamine, firing off, shouting for the body to release its secret weapon. Its secret weapon is oxytocin, the love hormone. We all want this hormone. We all need it. We all crave it. This hormone has the power to overpower, oppose, and block the effects of cortisol, okay? Preventing negative effects of stress on the brain. So this is why we say relationships are core to mitigating the impact of trauma, as well as building resilience, okay? Think about the different types of stress. It is what makes stress tolerable. This actually happening scientifically, hormonally in the body. Now, I also wanna mention that the power is behind, the power behind this moment is not just the physical contact of the hug. It's the relationship behind it. So it's that this adult knows what the child needs. This child knows that there is an adult that will meet their needs. So the answer isn't that we need to go around hugging everybody. Lord knows we can't even do that right now. <laughs> so it's just that we need to be attuned and responsive to the needs of others, our students. So even virtually, we can think of other ways we can cook up this hormone connection um, in increasing our oxytocin with each other is actually changing the biochemistry of our students in that moment. So I want to talk a little bit about a triggered moment. Okay. We're thinking about toxic stress and how that shows up in, um, in real life, in practice. So in a triggered moment, when there's a rush of cortisol and adrenaline, what happens is that the brain is greatly impacted. Remember the neural tissue is the most susceptible to change. So I'm gonna nerd out on three parts of the brain here just so we can understand what happens. So in a moment, a child's in a triggered or escalated state of mind. We have the amygdala, which is in the center of the brain. It actually grows in size temporarily, not forever, temporarily grows in size. And this is like our smoke signal of the brain. What's gonna call out, watch out, something's wrong, I need to survive. Right alongside the amygdala, we have our hippocampus. Now, with the amygdala, amygdala growing in size, the hippocampus gets smaller in size. The hippocampus has one job, learn and remember. That's all it wants to do is learn, store information, and remember, okay? Now, we have our prefrontal cortex in the front, loves being large and in charge, okay? Managing our thoughts, managing our emotions, managing behaviors. Now, in a moment, in a triggered moment, with all of that going on in the middle of the brain with the amygdala and the hippocampus, it has a hard time paying attention to anything else, which means we have moments where we're dysregulated. So when all that happens, the brain is physically left with our three survival options. And you may have heard of these before as our fight, flight, or freeze, okay? So I wanna explain this concept um, in the context of a story. But before I click over there, I just wanna mention that I always remember back when I was a teacher and my students would always be sick. Like they would be sick all the time, stomach issues, asthma, just being missing a lot of school. And once I learned this, I made that connection. Like, wow, 
all of these things are happening. Their body is getting locked into this um, stressful state because of the hormones running through their body, because of their um, just internally being in overdrive all the time. So we can imagine what that does to the immune system um, over time. And that was a result of what happened. Okay. So here's our lovely brain. This is when I tell my participants all the time that once you see this, you won't be able to look at students. You won't see your students or really anyone the same way once you understand what happens in the brain in the triggered moment. All right, here's the context. So you have a student, student is walking down the street with their mother and in a moment, the student mother gets robbed. Someone runs up on them, snatches her purse. And in that purse was their money, cell phone, keys to their home. Um, I think everyone would agree that that is a traumatic event to go through. Now, this same child goes into the classroom, seems to be acting, you know, fairly normal. They're sitting next to another child. And this other child reaches inside their desk and snatches their pencil case. Now, trigger. The amygdala in that moment would grow in size perhaps internally screaming, watch out, watch out, watch out. That's like your mama's purse, survive. And in that moment, a student might be actually screaming, give me back my pencil case, like right in the middle of the math lesson. So the teacher might see that commotion happening all over a pencil case. And this teacher might not think it's a big deal because they haven't been trained to consider context first and how that plays a role here. So the teacher might go over and do what many teachers might do to solve all the problems, take the pencil case. Now, neither student has the pencil case problem solved, but for one of those students, that's not just a pencil case. It's their mama's purse. So in that moment, a child isn't trying to learn a single thing you're trying to teach because they can't actually remember that they're in school, in your class, and your class has rules. In that moment, the amygdala has grown in size. And then, like I said, cramped the style of the hippocampus to where it physically cannot operate properly. A hippocampus is at a loss. It cannot remember or learn. Now we remember the prefrontal cortex, large and in charge in moments like this, usually can't seem to really hear over the amygdala scream and watch out growing and the hippocampus over there just being useless, not recalling what to do in the situation. So the brain only has access to the survival kit. So we see students shut down where a student is unresponsive, freeze. They fight the student that got them there or a student that is in close proximity or flight. They walk straight out of your classroom. So when students experience adversity, and continuous toxic stress, their brains get locked into this state. It makes them react to normal experiences as if they were actually life or death threats. It is wired into their physiological response to stress because of their lived context. So we talked about oxytocin and its power in opposing cortisol in those moments and how buffering relationships are the difference between toxic and tolerable stress, which means this is why we know that trust is the antidote for stress, okay? So I wanna land all of this. I know this a lot. I throw a lot into these sessions. <laughs> I wanna land all of this and consider just our role in the classroom and what we could do, all right? So we have our stages of intense behavior and we develop this because it really speaks to the dynamic nature of being a teacher managing a whole classroom, okay? So let's think about our role. Imagine you are the operator of this ride. This is your classroom. There's multiple students in there. They're experiencing different stages. And honestly, some of them are gonna come in and they're gonna go right to our first stage here, which is our irritating stage, okay? This is when they have that first amygdala response, starting to get triggers, triggering that alarm inside of their brains, hormone cortisol starting to come into play here, okay? But they're coming in, they might not come in at a normative state. That's not realistic to think that all students come in at that norm. Based on their context, they could walk in right at that level or even higher. Higher being our rising, 
This is when our body, because of that rise in cortisol, starts having trouble regulating our thoughts, emotions, and behavior. Our prefrontal cortex starts having a really difficult time. Now at peak, in my story, this is when, this is after the pencil case snatch. Now we have a student that is in a high reactive state and they show that by fight, flight, or freeze reactivity, okay? Then we have our falling action. This is where the support of adults start to engage and scaffold the regulation of thoughts and emotions for students and input that reminder of emotional and physical safety. Coming back down, we now have our calming. This is when all of our functionings are starting to return to a state of calm and then back to our normative state. So as an educator, as you notice, if you're attuned and responsive to your students, watching out for this level of engagement, then we know that that irritating phase before rising is really a sweet spot of intervention, proactivity, okay? And if you think about this example, if you have, um, it doesn't disrupt the environment too much, the experience too much. If as an educator, you have to hit stop and reverse the ride back down, okay? To really have an intervention with the student before they get to like a really escalated state. If you have to stop a lesson and actually address a student, privately address a student so that you could, because you notice the space that they're in, that is wildly important to maintaining a relationship with your students, okay? It's also important to know that when a student, because we can't notice them all, you're gonna have students who get to that peak place. We don't have eyes in the back of our heads. We won't catch it all the time. It's important to remember that as the operator of the ride, your job is on the ground. You can't hop up to the top of a wheel to a child in peak. That means you're riding the emotional ride with them. Then you have a whole class that you can't respond to and they'll be wondering what you're doing. But think about the brain in that state. You actually have to wait for them to head back down and get closer to you to teach them that lesson. Their brain has to return to a state of calm to be open to learning again. It is like a blackout state in peak. Oftentimes teacher make, teachers make the mistake of trying to teach a lesson when a child is in peak and then they say, oh, th that child just doesn't listen. Their brain is actually not open, physically open to learning the lesson in that state, okay? I also wanna note that sometimes you have to call for assistance, okay? Only when safety is truly at risk, okay? You have to hit the button, call for assistance because the child is actually threatening the safety of other students. But if they are not, and oftentimes they are not threatening much more than your nerves, okay? We have to be the first responder to create those conditions where they have the opportunity to calm down without judgment, immediate penalty and consequences, okay? They have to have that space to keep that relationship with you to know that you can handle this and that you still care about them um, as a person beyond that heated moment. One issue here is when we have teachers that call security just at the first breath when they see a student just in the irritating phase, especially if they have a challenging history with that student in helping them manage behaviors. This type of action wildly resembles what we see in adults doing when they call the police first and prematurely when they actually lack the skill to communicate and de-escalate situations. And that is not something that any educator signs up to preview for our students. So we don't wanna be teachers who press the gas on the wheel and speed kids up to peak because of our adult reactions. So it's always the teacher's job to de-escalate, always the adult's job to remain emotionally constant you are essential. You are the essential first responder in your classrooms, in your schools. So in checking back in on our social responsibility, we think about the moments of irritation and that escalation. And this is the time where you ask more, how are you questions, okay? We're not asking what's wrong with you. We're not judging our students because we know too much about the brain now. We know the brain isn't processing well enough in that state to be able to respond appropriately. We have to create the conditions around students to help them through that, okay? Um, I always like to say, survey the risk. 
sometimes it's not that big of a deal to give students the space they need to return to calm. But we always want students to be totally engaged 100% of the time, but that might not be realistic based on the context that they bring to the table. They might just need to be there, be reminded to breathe, left alone for a few minutes with the reminder that you're there when they're ready to talk. You will not teach them in that state of peak, but you can do more damage if you punt the relationship in those moments by kicking them out of class, just sending them to a buddy room or calling, calling security. Um, you want to restore the relationship and tell a joke. When I Tell a story about when you were a kid or when you might have experienced something. Even if they are not responding to your efforts in that exact moment, it does clue students in that the most important thing to you first is that they are okay and that you see them, okay? Students don't learn from who they don't trust. So considering everything we've discussed so far, just think about the context that you want to create for students. Still, still, even today, schools can still create the context that drives healthy, positive student development. So as we round out around our corner here for the last phase of this session, I wanna talk just a little bit about where does this go and what, what tools do we need to, what lens can we see this in? So one entry point, and I strongly say entry point, is being trauma-informed. And the key about this as a starting point is that being trauma-informed is understanding that it needs to guide all of your individual interactions, not just your individual interactions with your most challenging students. Um, it has to be a way of being. SAMHSA came up with four R's of being trauma-informed. And so I'm gonna synthesize those for you really quickly. And the first one is realizing. So you're asking what happened to this child instead of asking what's wrong with this child. You are seeing, you're recognizing when you see students struggling to meet behavior expectations, you're thinking about everything you know about the brain and the body and what we just learned today and saying that makes sense because of what I know. You're responding, approaching students with emotional constancy and concern with instead of that frustration and that anger, resisting re-traumatization, actually restoring students in the classroom by teaching them the skills and the mindsets that they need, okay? Now, I said it's the entry point because we wanna go beyond being informed. Now, it's not just enough to just be informed. We have to go beyond that. And one um, resource that I really love by Dr. Sean Jenright, um, he wrote an article here that's listed at the bottom about being healing centered and what it would take to get there. And so I just took a couple of those gems and applied it to the four R's. And I'm going to click through this. Also, in the participant materials, there are screenshots of each of these. So you don't need to feel like you need to write everything down because I know that's what I would do. Um, but if you want to just have those, you can check those out there. So for realizing, like I said, not just saying what's wrong with the child, okay, but going beyond that to saying what assets can I leverage to actually help build a skill in this moment? What assets does the, do the, does the child bring to the equation? Our students are not their trauma. They are not problems to fix, okay? Recognizing, recognizing that our students are fluctuating between environments, just like we are as, an, as adults. So they're going from environments that could have toxic levels of stress, could, and they're coming into school and recognizing that they're going to be going in and out of those environments and that our mindset has to constantly lead with context at the forefront. Responding, obviously fostering the possibility in your students, creating space to dream, creating space for joy and positivity in your classrooms, focusing on enhancing the structures and the conditions that contribute to well-being, resisting re-traumatization in the context of being healing-centered is when you respectfully and responsibly bring student voice into the equation thinking, acting more boldly about how you're going to restore young people and create places that they can just truly flourish in. Okay. Um, I want, I want to make sure I have enough time for a little bit of a Q&A at the end here. So in your participant materials, I also listed two strategies. Um, one, my favorite power of 10 is about remaining emotionally constant. How, it's like a little check for yourself on remaining emotionally constant. 
And the other is the two by 10 is, it is kind of what it sounds like, two minutes for 10 consecutive days. Um, this is a really great time of the year to do this because you've kind of gone through all of your get to getting to know you activities with your students. But if you took a look at your roster and you think, which students do I not know more about them than what they bring academically? Start with those students with an activity like this. And it's um, not contingent on behavior. It's time where they just can, they can count on you to be there to listen, to talk about whatever it is that they want to, that they want, want to talk about. These things that they mention in this time is like gold when you want to make a connection with a student and just restore a relationship in the event that they have a challenging moment. So the, it's a wealth of information you can learn from students just by spending that little bit of extra time that they can count on. I also put at the end of your um, participant materials an opportunity for you to really close the loop on your social responsibility for this session. And I mentioned like equi equitable educators are not perfect educators. We are all progressing and in just constant pursuit of just fulfilling our purpose in this profession. And I encourage you to, if you haven't done one before, to just walk through this guide of creating a purpose statement that you can just anchor yourself on in really challenging, difficult times like we're in right now. Um, but I just got a guide there for you to kind of think about what we learned today, but just to create a purpose statement that is meaningful for you. My call to action for you, a couple things. Share what you learned today um, with colleagues in your school. Keep this to the forefront of your learning um, in your professional learning communities. Prioritize building relationship foundations in your community. Be sensitive to the experiences of your students and your um, parents and families. Consider brain activities in your lesson planning for students. It is amazing. Like I said, I never look at students or anyone the same ever again when I see people um, escalating. I never look at them the same. It's a lot of power that comes from that as an educator, but the most power comes when children recognize that power within themselves, when they're able to start recognizing how it feels when they feel overwhelmed, when they feel scared, when they feel angry, um, what's happening in their brains and bodies. It helps them detach from the experiences that they're going through and then what happens in their brain and body and what is making them respond in that way. Um, so it's wildly powerful for the students to know this um, information. And then